thank you, um, everybody, and welcome. Um, I declare the meeting of the committee open at uh, 5.40 p.m. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which um, we meet, or certainly I'm meeting on that land um, here, uh, visually here in, um, uh, virtually here in Adelaide. I know um, others are in uh, different parts of the um, state, but uh, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains. We pay respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationships with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also res extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. And welcome uh, everybody to tonight's committee meeting. Uh, note that I am temporarily in the chair um, whilst the Deputy Lord Mayor deals with uh, some technology issues. We have an apology from uh, Councillor Donovan. She is on leave this week. Jenny, are you able to scroll down for me, please? Thank you. Um, we need to confirm the minutes from the previous meeting. Um, there's a recommendation here that the minutes of the meeting of the committee held on the 19th of May 2020 and a special meeting of the committee held on the 26th of May 2020 be taken as read and be confirmed as an accurate record of proceedings. Is there a mover for the recommendation? Have the Lord Mayor, do you wish to speak to that, Lord Mayor? Is there a seconder? Is there a seconder to the recommendation? I have uh, Councillor Martin. Did you wish to speak, Councillor Martin? Oh, I only do compliment you on your positive chairing, Chair. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Councillor Martin. Um, does anyone wish to speak to the motion? There being no one wishing to speak, I will put the motion to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? The motion is carried. Jenny, can you scroll down? Okay, we move on to um, item 4.1, the Adelaide Aquatic Centre, Aquatic and Leisure Centre final needs analysis. And I assume that's a matter that goes to you, CEO, to introduce the item. Is that correct? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, this is obviously a, a, um, a report that comes to you um, which closes out the, um, the needs analysis. What we'll do, we'll ask Tom McCready to just um, go, touch on the highlights, but I must say we'll take the report as read and largely respond to any questions. But Tom, are you there? Um, to help us through. Thank you, through you, presiding member. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, the basis of uh, tonight's report is to effectively come back to council to, as Mark has indicated, close off the needs analysis for the Adelaide Aquatic Centre. Um, as council is aware, we undertook extensive consultation over a 13 week uh, period um, in response to the needs analysis and what you have before you is that those findings and the commentary built into the final needs analysis. The needs analysis still uh, ultimately talks to demand and that demand is uh, being represented in regards to a number of options, but it's not limited to those options and we will explore those options at a workshop on the 16th of June but it certainly talks to options which range from a optimal of 1.3 million visitations down to a local facility of 500,000 visitations. Um, I think it, it's, it's clear that the centre is well and truly loved by all who use it. Um, and uh, there is a, a distinct uh, difference between what we would classify as recreational or public use and also uh, what I would regard as elite sports usage. Um, which is still evident in regards to the centre as not probably a hang up of the State Aquatic Centre, but because of locality, we get a lot of uh, elite sporting groups using that facility. So I think, I think it, what I'll do is just highlight that uh, in items uh, seven of the report, in the, the main report in item 12, we've detailed the responses which has been woven into the document. 
and really we're open for questions tonight, but noting that we will be coming back with the consultant on the 16th of June and to go through this in detail and also to refine those options with elected members. Thank you very much, um, Tom. Councillor Martin, I see your hand is raised. Is that in relation to this item or, or another? Jenny, could you unmute, unmute Councillor Martin? Can you hear me now? We can. Thanks, Phil. Yeah. Um, look, no, it was in relation to a previous matter, but I do wish to speak about this, and uh, I'm happy, however, to let others speak first. Well, uh, Councillor Martin, yours was the only hand I saw raised at, at that time, so I'm happy for you to kick us off if you'd like to uh, ask a question or make a comment. Sure, sure. Look, I just wanted uh, uh, to make a couple of comments. Um, when uh, the controversy began over the crows providing a new aquatic centre in return for parklands, I do remember the strong assertion um, from uh, Team Adelaide mainly that uh, the facility had been neglected for many years um, and that uh, previous councils um, uh, were discredited by their lack of action. And I think this report does provide the means, the basis uh, for moving forward uh, and uh, for uh, the team and everybody, in fact, to endorse an upgrade of this centre. Um, the, the upgrade, uh, I would like uh, to argue, um, that is required is consistent with what's uh, proposed at 12.3, that is the, uh, the consumer requirement, which is for recreational uh, facilities, including uh, recreational swimming, lap swimming, swim lessons, cafe, gym, spa, sauna, and so on. But also, and I think equally important, 12.6, which is the other set of users, which are the professional and sporting organizations, which are saying, we also want to see um, uh, located at the facility, um, a 50 meter pool at two meters depth, um, uh, 25 metres wide, available for sporting use, electronic scoreboards, storage, meeting, marshalling rooms and the like, so that the facility uh, provides them with the venue to drive patronage. Now, we already know from the needs analysis that uh, the potential patronage of the centre in the coming years could be as high as one and a half million. And in order to meet those expectations to produce what the needs analysis infers would be a good profitable outcome, we would need option four in the needs analysis. Now, I've uh, previously moved pre-COVID that uh, council uh, gauge the interest of state and federal governments in uh, funding an upgrade, uh, whether that is on the same site or on another site in that area. Um, uh, and I will, in fact, I've already lodged a motion for the next council meeting, um, pointing out that there is a need for us to move very quickly on this because um, though my previous motion was pre-COVID, post-COVID, we know that there is a lot of uh, federal and state money available, but we also know that there are many competing interests. Uh, many local government areas, many cities are jockeying with their proposals. And so uh, I'm asking that we treat this with the utmost urgency uh, and uh, get it moving as quickly as possible. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Canol, you had your hand up. Yeah, just while we do that, can I just remind um, council members tonight, we should be really just asking questions and seeking clarification. This matter will be tabled at full council next week where debate can happen for you. Thanks. Thank you, CEO. Councillor Canol, with, with the CEO's advice, in mind, do you wish to speak? Sorry, we'll need to unmute you there. Jenny, are you able to do that? I can't do that on my end. No, she's, she's got me to do it. <laughs> there you go. Um, thank you very much. And thank you very much to, uh, you know, to administration. They've done a Herculean job on this and I, think I appreciate it. I think, um, I mean, I do appreciate the, I mean, the, 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 the quality of the, of the actual um, you know, project. And I just think we just need to keep in mind, I suppose, an open mind. And when I read through this, that uh, it, this is an ambitious project. 
And I think we do need to also keep in mind that uh, uh, the solution may may be uh, more broad than just you know, in, in the same place. And I, I, I just think to keep that in mind that we should uh, look at the city as a whole and see, is there a way that we can use, have this facility? Certainly, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, see if we can uh, get assistance in, in uh, uh, you know, building it or, or repairing it or whatever, um, but also keep an open mind where we think we can have it so that it does benefit the actual uh, city itself, rather than being a service uh, that necessarily uh, doesn't connect people with Adelaide. But other than that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Knoll. Did anyone else wish to comment on this matter? I'll just, Councillor Martin, you've already spoken, so I'll just see if anyone else who hasn't had an opportunity yet would like to speak, and then I'll, I'll go to you again. Did anyone else wish to speak? No? Okay, Councillor Martin. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Just in response to Councillor uh, Canole's observation, if, if I can ask the administration, um, uh, Councillor Canole's uh, clearly put on the table the possibility that the Aquatic Centre might be located somewhere else. Is that also in your thinking, CEO? Is that the view of your team? It should go somewhere else? Uh, through the chair, at this stage, we don't have a view on the location. Um, it's intended uh, that we will, on the 16th of June, take council members for a site visit to the Aquatic Centre to talk about the deficiencies and concerns with the current centre. Um, and at that time, following which, we'll be able to have an informed discussion. So location of future centres, whether it be on the current site or future site, is entirely at the discretion of council, subject to um, conversation. Uh, if I could just make clear that I, I think it should remain in North Adelaide, as you'd expect me to say, CEO. And if we're going to the centre on the 16th, I'll, uh, I'll go and get my, uh, my bathers. Keep the speedos at home. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Any, uh, any, other, uh, any other comments? Councillor Moran, was that your hand? No? Okay. Um, if uh, no other member... Oh, Councillor Moran, you're raising your hand. No. Um, look, if, uh, if no other... Um, oh, no, Councillor Moran, you are. Apologies. Can you unmute yourself? Or Jenny, can you... Un um, Sorry, Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, look, I don't agree with uh, Councillor Martin. I would um, think that another location uh, would be desirable, as long as it's a good location. Um, North Adelaide was chosen, of course, it's the park lands, free land and was initially built as just an open air pool for the residents, uh, then became the elite centre and that's when the roof went on. And as we all know, or should know, that it replaced the city guards that you might have seen in the advertiser uh, today or yesterday. I think we should investigate the, the state government's appetite for moving the, uh, uh, demolishing the aquatic centre at where it is now and putting it back on the riverbank as was the city guard. Um, and make it much more central. I don't think it needs to be in North Adelaide. I think it could be put more centrally. Um, it's easy, it's not very far away, but uh, I think the concept of a city bars replacement on the Torrens is, I find very attractive, as long as the current situation is returned to park lands. Also, I just wanted to ask Tom or whoever was talking, is the, uh, if we don't do that, is the uh, of an open air, Pool uh, canvas, uh, such as Hazelwood Park, Lord Pool, Unley Pool, or very successful pools. Because we don't, I noticed you said that we did have elite swimmers. We made it very clear when we were overlooked uh, as the state centre for Marion after we had uh, done a lengthy bid um, that we didn't have to carry the burden of the elite swimmers. They would go to Marion because they're expensive, they take up a lot of water, and you, they were a, a burden a burden that the state government used to help us with, but doesn't now with the pool as it is. So um, another location I agree with, um, the Riverbank, uh, an open air pool I'd like to see canvas. So this is just a really little uh, introduction to when we make, uh, we have a proper discussion. Is that right? Because this isn't a proper discussion. Tom McCready, would, would you like to respond? Presiding member, one of the things that we will be doing on the 16th of June is we will be looking at three options 
not 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 in regards to the four options you have here. So the options would be a redevelopment within the current site, a brownfield site, which is a on the existing site, or a greenfield site, which is on the new site. Um, and then effectively, also what we would be looking at is some form of a hybrid in regards to looking at potentially what you would need for an internal facility and what would an outdoor facility look like as well if it was attached on to that. So we'll be coming back to council for discussion and deliberation. Thank you, Tom. Councillor Moran, does that resolve your so question? we not into this discussion paper that we've seen today. Because- Tom, do you want to just you respond to clarify remember? that? No, you're, you're not locked into what, what the, the what Steve Kipper has actually responded to was first and foremost was looking at the demand or needs. Um, and that clearly has identified demand in excess of 1 million up to 1.3 million. How that actually looks and where that looks comes down to council's willingness and also comes down to funding. Um, so uh, effectively, what we're able to say is your optimal uh, was it visitation 1.3. How that looks, scalability, and whether we would have to be, be able to support that. One of the things also I'll need to draw attention to when you talk about the 1.3 million visitations, can I please draw your attention to the size of the car park also? Because car parks have to reference in regards to demand. So just be noting in regards to that. So that, that looks at a bigger car park. So that's part of a conversation that we've been having. But that's, right, Tom, that, that is really just working out how you design the replacement there. I think we, we need now to look at a big picture. I think Franz brought it up too. We have an opportunity now to really partner with the state government and get a good uh, leisure facility moved out of the park lands. Um, I, I don't, there's nothing there in that your needs analysis that an experienced um, educated council didn't know before. Um, we know how many people went there. We know what they need. I'm shocked that we still support elite uh, facilities. They are supposed to go to Marion. So uh, with all due respect, uh, I think uh, what we've seen tonight is a good base uh, to perhaps educate councillors that haven't been uh, very au fait with the workings of it as uh, more experienced councillors have, because we used to run the pool at the board so we know very well, and you know that we know very well, Tom. Um, so I think that this report should be just considered as a background document. And when we go to the workshop, we are not constrained by these th this report. I'm sorry, but it's it's really not good enough, in my opinion. Well, well Councillor Moran, we might leave that as a, a comment, unless, um, Tom, you had anything you wanted to say in, in response to that? Just, just quickly, just to provide Councillor Moran with a level of comfort, you're not constrained with the report. Uh, actually, to, to the, the case being on the 16th of June, we're quite interested to hear your feedback in regards to how we could actually look at the future of recreational aquatic and dry facilities within the city, um, be that on the site, be that on the other site, and be that uh, in regards to external funding options. Okay, thank you. Tom, I sorry, Councillor Moran, I, I, if this is the, another point in relation to this, I might just get you to, to ask this question and then we will move on because we've got a, a lot to deal with. I know, I understand, but this is important. What happens with administrative, administrators put reports up and then councillors like sheep think that they can only think within that square. And I just want to say to that councillors, you don't have to do that. Just use this as a background document. You can decide anything you like. And you don't have to worry about how many cars in the car park. Um, that, that's blinding you with minutia and detail. So um, I think a little bit of, uh, what does the team like to say, blue sky thinking, a bit outside the box. Um, move the aquatic centre, that should be considered. If we leave it there, it should be considered whether we do an only pool. We, none of those are mentioned. And I think that's important. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councillor Moran. We'll, we'll leave that there. I see the Deputy Lord Mayor has returned um, to the meeting. Are you able to resume the chair, Deputy Lord Mayor? Can can you be heard? Can I be? Is that is that better? No. Yeah, that, that is better. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll relinquish the chair, but I am here on standby should you need me, um, Deputy Lord Thank you. Thank you. I've had to five devices later and I'm on my iPad now, so I'm just learning. 
Um, but thank you, Rob. That all looked very good. I think we just have the Lord Mayor left in the speaker's queue. I don't know how to unmute you, Lord Mayor, but I think you can well, do I've this. done that. Thank you. Um, look, you know, I think uh, what Councillor Moran is saying is also think conversations I've had with the administration in terms of what it might be. Um, I did actually have a conversation very much about what would that look like. I went and took photos of Hazelwood Pool and also was really interested in what they went through to get it there. Um, but whether it would operate for eight months a year, be open air and close the kids, put a gym, what that might be. Um, I don't think we need to be constrained by this report. We are receiving a report, so we have this to inform us. And I do actually think that the site visit on the 16th and that workshop, and it might not be the only workshop, we need, might do a series of workshops, is for us to get all of those on the table in terms of location, size, who we're catering for. It is not an elite state facility. It is a regional facility. I'm very aware, as every, everybody else is, that less than 10% of our ratepayers actually use the swimming centre. If we are going to invest so heavily in a regional facility, we need to make sure that upward of 25 or 30 percent of our ratepayers are using that facility um, and even though it's it is well it is much loved it's not an even though we want it to continue to be much loved um, the demand profile says says that in terms of what the expectation is of our growth um, what I would actually also ask um, Sean and Tom if you could just circulate the attendance data for the last perhaps four to five years, including swim school and attendances, so that we can actually see the, the pattern of attendances throughout the year. Um, that may help inform. And, um, and I'm also aware, as are the rest of the councillors, that there are other three sort of major swimming pools in the city itself. There is the next gen on the riverbank. There is the big, huge pool in a University of South Australia that they invested under the Grand Hall in Hindley Street that is also open to the public. And there's the one in Flinders Street, which Christian Brothers have, which is also available to the public. So we need to make sure we're catering for growing populations. And so uh, that may inform us or direct us back to North Adelaide in terms of where we have that population that we would want to be using the swim centre and also the surrounding councils. Councillor Martin, we do have a lot of work under way. Um, and as the rest of the councillors know, we are talking to uh, all levels of government as well as surrounding councils about this and how we can actually then work collaboratively to get a regional centre that is going to appeal to those numbers. So um, look forward to the 16th um, of June. Thanks, Lord Mayor. And I'll go to Councillor Sims. You are unmuted. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I think one of the things that really comes across uh, strongly for me reading this needs analysis is the importance of us engaging with the community when it comes to considering the options that are before us. I think that um, there is consensus among elected members that we do need to do something in terms of dealing with the Aquatic Centre and we have a range of different scenarios that we can consider. But I would really like us to turn our minds to how best we consult with the community around what the options are for us. Um, and, you know, this would be a great opportunity for some sort of people's panel or committee involving representatives from the community to look at the range of options and consider how best we deal with this, how we finance it, what form it takes and so on. Because I think one of the lessons we have to take from the fiasco around the Crows proposal was the failure to build community consensus can have very serious consequences. So I'd really encourage councillors to think about that um, when we approach this question in coming months. Um, and also to highlight, of course, the need for us to resolve our um, process with respect to unsolicited bids in the parklands. That's an ongoing challenge for this council. Um, but I see the Crows are still interested in the site. And unless we resolve this process, we will get ourselves into hot water yet again with the community. So. Um, I'd urge members to keep those things in mind as we have these discussions in the months ahead. Thank you, Councillor Sims and Councillor Martin. Just a, uh, a quick question as a consequence of the Lord Mayor's comments and Councillor Sims's comments. Is the administration aware of any revived proposal from the Crows for Park 2 and the Aquatic Centre? 
Through the chair, um, no, no, um, we haven't been approached formally as, I, as far as I'm aware by the Crows in any way. Um, I just understand they were comments made to the media recently, but that's all we've, we've noticed as have you. So um, there's no formal process or no formal approach being made that we can refer to. Thank you. We appear to have lost the Deputy Lord Mayor. So, Councillor Sims, are you happy to step in again? Rob? Yep. Jenny, could you unmute Councillor Sims, please? Sorry, Lord Mayor. I was actually just plugging my um, laptop in. It was about to go flat, but yes, I'm still here. Um, did anyone else wish to speak on this matter? Or um, I think the speaking list has been extinguished. We will move on. Um, Jenny, are you able to put the agenda item in front of the screen? I'm sorry, I'm just trying to open up Councillor Hyde's um, email that he's sent me with the running sheet. Um, good. Excellent. Ah, great, thank you. Um, members, this brings us to item 4.2, the citywide business model. And I believe this, is, this discussion is being led by Michelle English, is that correct? Um, um, Oh, through the Ian. chat. Sorry, Ian. Yes, through the chat. Thanks, Councillor Sims. Apologies. We're off to you. Can everyone hear me okay? We Great. can. Um, I just want to intro this project uh, for um, an outline, a bit of the background, so people are fully across where it's come from. Um, in 2016, 2020 strategic plan for council, you asked staff to investigate options for a citywide business model, which, uh, which we've done. Um, and then the 2020-2024 strategic plan councils our staff to implement a new model. So we're in the, the start of that process. So tonight's report is really an initial step in achieving this component um, of your strategic plan. Um, and I'd really like to acknowledge and thank uh, a raft of people who have been involved in the discussion to date, the debate and the perspectives. It's been really robust, it's been really healthy. I think when you get a change of this sort of magnitude, it's great to get so many um, voices out there. Um, the Adelaide Business Collective have, have been great. The precinct groups have been great. Business leaders and also the perspectives provided by some other jurisdictions who have really generous, been generous with their time. And I particularly refer to the CR Wellington um, and Auckland Tourism Events and also Brisbane Marketing. They've all been, been fabulous. Um, I think we should continue to expect um, and embrace more dialogue on a project like this. Um, but I think one thing that's become very, very clear is there is a rally cry um, for a new model. It's been, been really loud and clear from all of those groups that I've mentioned before. Um, probably even more so now that we face these headwinds of uh, sort of the global and, and local economic challenges. Um, there's still much more to do, um, but tonight's report, just to break it down, is simply about a recommendation uh, that a subsidiary of council under section 42 of the Local Government Act be pursued. Um, there were four options that uh, we have examined and Michelle can talk to those in a minute. Um, but we are making a recommendation to go to the next step tonight. Um, just so everyone is aware, the detailed governance and financial structure to support a new subsidiary would be the subject of some specific workshops with elected members, including detailed discussions and getting your input on dedicated charter, board representation, funding streams, all that level of detail. So we're not here to, to go through a hell of that tonight. Um, we're definitely going to have to take some more, more detailed um, discussions with the industry and stakeholders and precinct groups. I think that's well and truly acknowledged here internally. Um, we have outlined a, a timeline uh, with a report here that a new subsidiary would commence by January the 1st, 2021. So we'd love some feedback on, on that timeline too. And just to clarify recommendation two, the intent of that is to investigate if, there, if one of the existing charters of an existing um, subsidiary Theory could be reworked, and that, that's purely to try and simplify the process to establish a new body. Uh, so I just want to be clear about that second recommendation. Um, but back through the chair, um, uh, I'll pass over to Michelle around any specifics, but I appreciate you guys um, taking on board some of that background today. Thank you, Ian. Michelle? Uh, so I'll take the report as read. I think Ian's provided a, a good recommendation. 
a, a good recommendation, a good um, overview. Um, so I'm sure there'll be a number of questions that we can answer. All right, thank you. I've got a few hands being raised. Um, the first is uh, Councillor Kira. Councillor Kira. Thanks, thanks Chair. Um, thanks Ian, thanks administration. Um, there is, um, it, it would appear there is a perception uh, at the moment that it's the RMMA. We, we all understand that this is to be a new body uh, with a new name uh, and uh, equitable representation across the board. But the administration, what, uh, what steps can you take at this particular juncture uh, to neutralize some of the perceptions that this uh, is simply the RMMA uh, that they will have undue sway uh, over the, the upcoming body. What, what are the particular steps right now can you take to quell uh, those perceptions? Yes, yeah, so I do understand that um, some um, perceptions of reading the report thought that um, it was that the RMMA would you know, be on, almost on steroids. So that's certainly not what we're looking at. So the reason I suggested um, looking at RMA and its charter was there is some overlap um, in terms of marketing um, and promotion that RMA undertakes. Obviously, this body um, would have a much broader remit for the whole of the city. Um, and the reason I was looking at RMMA is, would council actually want to have three subsidiaries, given that one, that I don't know, let's call it the citywide business model subsidiary, um, would actually probably be in a number of the functions that the RMMA is already doing. ACMA is quite different and it has a head lease and it, and it has a um, obviously responsibility for um, the tenancies uh, in the central market. So that doesn't really um, have um, the same type of intent or purpose that this new subsidiary would have. So it was really looking at is, is there an existing vehicle that could simplify the process for a new uh, subsidiary. If you're amending a charter, which could be significant amendments to a charter, you just need to table it with the minister. If you're creating a new charter for a new subsidiary, you actually have to get approval from the minister. So um, at the forum that we heard most recently, it seems that there was um, certainly a lot of interest in really putting the foot to the pedal and getting um, action really quickly done. So this was a way of uh, basically fast tracking that. Thanks, thanks, Michelle. Um, so uh, what um, what outreach at this particular point will be undertaken uh, to quell any of these perceptions? Uh, will it be made very clear uh, right now to stakeholders? And how will it made clear uh, to stakeholders? Uh, this is that this is about renaming. Re this is about a new body. Uh, that will essentially replace uh, the RMMA, if that's correct. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good um, question, Councillor Kira. Um, so certainly, and probably, I, you know, to be fair, I could have drawn it out more in the report. Um, I do talk in there about there's a, a real need to understand um, what the role in the charter might be for um, business community and precinct groups. So um, following this, if, if, if council decides a section 42 is the way to go, that gives us a framework to say, well, right, we need to develop a charter. So we would be working with um, our business community, precinct groups um, to help inform what that charter would look like in terms of say board representation, how you might actually have that flow of two-way information from the, you know, from the board and um, the body helping to administer this. Um, to the precinct groups and to other businesses that aren't represented in precinct groups and, and back and forth. So absolutely, we need to engage um, our precincts and other bodies. And you'll see that, that that is part of the indicative timetable before we would bring, I suspect, a charter back with a lot of questions to council for a workshop. So we would be engaging with them. Okay, can I just finish by, can I just urge uh, immediate uh, speedy and effective outreach uh, to all precinct groups and to all businesses uh, to put out this fire and to prevent uh, this perception that has already caused a, a major stumble at the starting block. If that can be uh, acknowledged by the um, administration, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely, we'll do that. 
Thanks, Councillor Kieran. Thanks, Michelle. Now, I'll just check in with Deputy Lord Mayor. I can see that you have returned, Deputy Lord Mayor. Are you able to proceed with confidence or would you like me oh, to continue? Well, I can proceed. I don't have much confidence. Is that, um, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you. Can everybody can. else hear, hear the Deputy Lord Mayor? I'm just on my, I think I think on most can. Now. Apologies, apologies to all, and thank you, Rob. No, um, no problem. I'll hand back over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think we are good to go. And according to the list I have in uh, front of me, um, Councillor Martin is next. Jenny, if you can unmute Councillor Martin. Oh no, it's disappeared now. Yep. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, excellent. Thank you. Good. Okay. Look, I hear what everybody is saying. I uh, just draw everyone's attention to the fact that the administration says the genesis for this was a motion of council on the 24th of July, 2018, which was about resourcing main street or precinct groups. Um, it was not about this. And uh, this document um, has caused concern for precinct groups because it doesn't deal in any way um, with the issues that are raised and have been raised for many years, including resourcing and equitable funding and the like. And you'll see those at uh, paragraphs 11.1 and 11.2. But the, uh, the issue that has arisen and which Councillor Kira is so keen to see addressed is that in the absence of any assurance about their future, and in fact, in the presence of clauses like 41, which show that precinct groups would be subservient to this citywide business model and um, would be reliant on them for any funding, if there is funding, and in the absence of what they regard as satisfactory consultation, groups including the City Business Collective and other stakeholders are saying to individual councillors, including me, God, stop this. This is not what we expected. We want to have much more consultation and the city needs to let go of this control that it's trying to impose on us and most particularly by attempting to in some way ingratiate the run of all management authority into this, as it does, and the paper makes clear that there's a discussion to be had about how you deal with the run of all management authorities' uh, use of funds that come from uh, the rate, uh, the separate rate that's charged to members. So they're saying, look, we're not happy about this. And the alarm bells are coming from all sides. Uh, the message is, put a hold to this. Um, let's put together something like, and I've had this approach from many business people in the city, put together something like a steering group, involve us much more closely, and you will have a result that has buy-in. Now, I, I, I am not going to stand in the way of the, uh, the Lord Mayor's desire to have a citywide business model. That, that is fine. But if it ticks those other boxes, that is that we get the buy-in of precinct groups, that they have an assurance about their future, that there is a structure that the City Business Collective and other stakeholders, including landlords, feel that they can embrace, then I'll endorse this. But as it is, what we have is a cake that is underbaked. Uh, it needs a few more ingredients before it goes back in the oven. Thank you, Councillor. And we'll go to Councillor Noel. Um, yes, thank you again to the administration and particularly Michelle and Craig for their work. Um, and I, I must say, I enjoy being part of baking a cake because I think what we're doing now and what, what is happening with, with all the business precinct groups and, and all the rest is people coming together as we formulate our concept. And I think that's fantastic because this is what this conversation is about because I certainly want to have an, an overarching body, fantastic. Section 42, and I suppose it's, it's uh, I suppose it, uh, uh, trying to use the, the Arundel Mall Authority as, as a guide of what this looks like is possibly uh, murking the waters simply because uh, that is, that is the, the, the mechanism by which you use it. And they, they have that. It's not the, the actual organization that's going to run it. 
it's just uh, the, the model at which it's running at. And I think it's a bit, uh, it's a bit difficult when people see uh, those sorts of uh, comparisons. So it does make it a little bit, um, uh, you know, you can be a little bit fearful, but it is just, I like the section 42. So, you know, that's good. Um, uh, as I've indicated many times now through the various channels, um, the board representation uh, and, and also how the organizational chart runs for this is very critical and how we can now uh, interact very closely with all the stakeholders. I think that's fantastic. And I think we need to be very careful about that. It does need to run fairly uh, arm's length. And I do think uh, as that sort of thing goes, um, certainly a good relationship with the administration. But again, uh, it is, it is a, a, it's trying to be a, 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 an overarching uh, model that is about commercial interests and, and obviously city interests overall. So it does need to be a little bit more arm's length in, in some of its ability to be able to perform those tasks. Um, I mean, RMMA has it, and I mean, uh, ACMA particularly has that. Um, I mean, if I comment with ACMA, ACMA has a far more intimate role with the actual running of that market. So therefore, it has functions that it, it, that it needs to continue, whereas the marketing, et cetera, can be part of an, a, a greater um, you know, uh, body um, where you have specific uh, uh, directions and specific uh, focuses on those sort of major precincts that doesn't diminish the other precincts. Um, I think uh, when this process too, and, and, and I suppose people are being concerned because they, again, they're thinking they would get, they've been given something rather than being part of a deliberation. I think we may still, uh, as part of this, create mechanisms by which various interest groups can interact. In other words, create groups that sit on, uh, in, in with or underneath that communicate directly. So, so you can talk about landlords as a, as a group that you can, as, as a subcommittee, et cetera. So again, very much connecting closely together. And I think if we think of things like that, this is the whole concept here is you take all those that have concerns and, and interests in a, a successful city, um, you bring them together in a mechanism that they feel that they're getting, they're being heard, but also they're being informed. And with all this wonderful uh, concern from, from our stakeholders is fabulous because they're actually now talking to us before we bake our cake. So I think a, a bit of that, um, I think I'm quite excited by what we're doing. And a few more goes at this, we should be able to refine it and have influences from all those people that have concerns so that we can actually refine uh, our, our finished product uh, so that they can be a, you know, happy with it. Thank you. Thanks, Franz. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Chair. Um, look, uh, to follow on from um, Councillor Knoll's um, point, yes, it is great that uh, stakeholders are making contact with us, but we have to also listen to what they are saying. Um, that's the, the critical thing. Um, and I think what is uh, clear from the, the feedback that we've received is that there is some concern um, around this. And so I do want to dig into it a little bit more deeply um, before uh, we are in a position to, to uh, formulate um, exactly how um, we're going to proceed. I think consultation is key. Um, I guess for me, one of the key anxieties that I have had is that a new structure could potentially um, disenfranchise some of the smaller players, some of the smaller businesses um, and traders in the city, there is a risk that their voices could be um, subsumed by a kind of super committee. I know, um, Michelle and Ian, you addressed this earlier in, in your comments, um, but I'd be really keen to have a chat with you um, out of session about um, some of those issues. I'm sorry, I haven't had an opportunity to do so um, before tonight's committee, um, but I'll set something up to uh, talk to you about that before um, the uh, next council meeting and to share with you some of the concerns that have been expressed with me via email because um, it's clear I think we, we maybe still have a bit more work to do in terms of um, engaging with stakeholders here. Thank you, Rob. Councillor Mackey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in broad, I, I support the objective and the intent of um, uh, the model that is being explored and, and I recognise that uh, this is something that's been in the ether for a couple of years at least now um, and appreciate also the administration's desire to respond to the, the sense of urgency that was being expressed in the forum uh, the other week. Um, um, but I think there, there may be two 
facets, uh, uh, complementary but different facets here. One, one is about getting the model right. The other is about hearing and understanding the, the pain and difficulty, the existential difficulty that um, many city businesses of the four and a half thousand or so city businesses are currently experiencing in the, in the wake of COVID-19. Um, this is too important to get wrong um, because when, when we get it wrong, uh, stakeholders walk away utterly disillusioned and um, elected bodies uh, will, will, you know, understandably throw hands up in the air and think, well, we tried and, you know, nobody was happy, therefore nothing will happen. Um, uh, a little more, engage, uh, some more engagement and consultation, I, I believe, can deliver a model uh, that um, will go considerably further uh, than the, the status quo uh, in, in getting us uh, there. And we don't necessarily need, and I appreciate this is, a, 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 this is an information session, not a, not a debate. We don't necessarily need um, to uh, simply uh, uh, um, co-opt the, uh, the uh, Rundle Mall um, Management Authority instrument. Um, I, I would like to think that a government who's very, uh, a state government that's very, very concerned about business sustainability post COVID um, uh, will be able to respond in a timely manner uh, if we're looking to establish a new and separate um, uh, Section 42 uh, instrument. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Councillor Kuros. Thank you, Chair. I like baking a cake, so I would say this is ingredient number one. But uh, I have a question in following on from Councillor Mackey. What's the time frame between setting up a new model to um, using the current charter model that the Rundle Moor Authority have at the moment? What's the time frame between that? Sorry, just unmuting and the computer's a long way away from my arms. Um, so, so the difference between obviously um, amending a, a charter, which is fairly, you know, fairly quick, you submit it and then um, it needs to go out in a notice um, for, for, you know, public in the Gazette. Um, the, uh, it, you know, it's, it's difficult to know, but it's lodging it with the, with the minister, obviously, uh, then there'd be some sort of um, internal process in state government through the Office of Local Government. Um, I would anticipate that it, it would at least add a month, um, possibly more. We could obviously um, encourage them to deal with it as efficiently um, and promptly as quick, you know, as possible, um, which, you know, could add a month or possibly more to um, the time for commencing. And if we were to do a new one? But not if you do a new sorry. charter. So, so if you if you use the existing Rundle Mall charter and amended it, you know, obviously quite significantly, yeah. um, then you just need to submit that charter to the minister, no. um, and then it goes out in a gazette. If you write a new one, you yeah. also have to submit it to the minister. Yeah. Then there needs to be an assessment process by the minister and his department. Um, and right. that I expect right. would it take at least, you, normally you'd take at least a month. Um, and then right. obviously you know, we'd expect that they would approve it um, right. and it needs to be gazetted. So right. it is a timing right. um, issue. And then of course, if, and this is all up for discussion and what council's direction, um, preferred direction would be, then of course, if you wanted uh, a new body to take over some of the functions of the RMMA, um, if it wasn't just amending the charter, you would then also need the minister's approval to wind up um, the RMMA subsidiary. So there are just some extra steps uh, if you start with a whole new subsidiary, which, which is right. fine. You know, we can look at both right. approaches. Okay, um, sorry, um, you were itching a bit and I missed a bit of what you said before. So as far as I understand it, you know, it's if 
we amend the current charter, the RMMA one, we would be able to work more efficiently, which is what everyone is telling us is what they want. And by amending it, we can amend it the way, we can even change the name if, if we want to obviously that yes, would be something that it would do <laughs> so um change the name and change the functions of the charter whatever we whatever we agree to and then once we've got that in play we work on the operational side of it which is a lot of the concerns that i hear tonight which then goes out to consultation once once that is done and then we go from there okay well, that's very clear to me that saying that you're telling me that by doing it this way, it moves a lot faster and less complicated than if we went and did a new one. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kouros. I, I think just to clarify. Mm, no, shoot, Michelle. Sorry, I'm um, Hello, Mayor. I was just going to say, just to clarify, um, recommendation two is to investigate using the RMMA charter so it's not a you know done deal so to speak it's just wanting to see whether that's something that council would want us to do all right thank you um uh members was there anyone else who wanted to speak on this topic there are no hands up if there aren't then um i'll just ask a couple of <clears throat> a couple of questions <laughs> Um, so, Michelle, so from what I can tell, the RMMA more or less, if we go down this path, as highlighted at two, um, it, it will it essentially will cease to exist because you would you would scrap the charter and, and start again. There would be a full, an absolute rewrite. It, it's a completely different, you know, function. Some of the functions have similarities, but it's 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 vastly um, expanded, very very different. Um, Correct. Yes, that that is correct. There are some functions that would remain the same in terms of marketing and promotions. You would expect the new subsidiary would do those, um, but but you, I guess you're you're using that as the mechanism to create a new subsidiary, um, and then there would obviously be a function within it, um, like there would be looking at precinct areas um, to to look at how you would um, support Rundle Mall, like the rest of the city. Well, yeah, so it's it's merely a, a, a legalistic vessel in order to get a new one established as quickly as possible. That is exactly um, the approach. Cool. Yes, I think that I think that will um, uh, lower a lot of people's anxiety levels, my my own included. Um, uh, when it comes to the, comparing the two different processes um, for either amending a section forty two or setting one up from scratch. Um, uh, when you set one up from scratch, is there consultation built into that process? So does the minister have to uh, consult? Is that is that part of it? Oh, I'll check it out and come back to you. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. No, no worries at all. I, I have a feeling it might be. I'm just, I'm mm. just not sure. Um, uh, but I, I guess I guess that 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 settles me greatly. Thank you, Michelle. And I'll just make um, I'll just make some quick comments on the matter. Um, uh, obviously, it did cause a lot of anxiety and angst in the community because a lot of people have been working towards this for a long time. Um, uh, and I think perhaps the drafting of the recommendation um, uh, was not were not our intention. Or your intention was not clear there. So I thank you for um, clearing it up. I, I do still think we need um, uh, we need uh, some consultation around this, and I think it needs to be um, a bit more meaningful than um, the Zoom um, forum that we held, which was well attended, but by virtue of how it's operating, and you had many different people at many different parts, or, or as far as their knowledge of the process is concerned, different stages. Um, uh, so it wasn't as fruitful as as one would have hoped. So. Um, uh, I do think we need to uh, sit down with some uh, more uh, uh, smaller groups, I think, um, and have some of those uh, more meaningful sort of roundtable discussions um, with uh, members of the ABC, um, but also uh, small businesses, small business owners from precinct groups um, and other small businesses um, as well. Uh, I think we need to feed them into the process. And 
uh, if this is if this is going to come in next month again to a workshop, is was that the intent at this stage? Uh, so um, it is a tight time frame to come into next month as a as a workshop. We'd obviously work as quickly as we can. Uh, that will um, you know we need to give our precincts and business community some some notice around those engagement um, opportunities and you know to ensure that they're meaningful and able to um, inform what some of the questions we'll put to council are in relation to the charter so we will do our best endeavors for um, July but it could possibly be August yeah okay okay but still really moving at pace um, which I Thanks. Um, important. Um, sorry, Sandy, I just see your hand up. I'll just throw over to you if you had something to add to that. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, it was just um, uh, one of the things that I think would be, be very helpful. Um, we've, we've all been contacted by stakeholders over the last few days, but um, it's not a new concept. It's been around for at least 20 years that I'm aware of, um, and I do think it will deliver us a really an excellent model for the city. But one of the things I think that will help a lot, uh, Michelle, is if, uh, yes, the consultation, I think we're all agreed that we should be doing more, particularly around the charter and the and the actual functions of the new entity, uh, but the development of some FAQs, so frequently asked questions, so that we can have somewhere really, really obvious and distribute to all the precinct groups, distribute to the businesses, distribute to ABC, so that these are the questions. So I wouldn't mind um, if members, just in terms of, because you've all been contacted by different people, a lot of the same people, um, would be great if we can just gather up some of those questions, shoot them through to uh, Michelle, and we can actually develop a, a series of FAQs that uh, we all have to uh, talk to members of the public when they come to us and our stakeholders. Um, I think that would be really helpful. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Kuros. I just want to reiterate that that's a great idea, Lord Mayor. I would really think that that would put a lot of people at ease, and um, and I think that it's a great way forward to get clarity in regards to it. So yeah, great initiative. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Excellent. Thank you. Mary, um, and I'll just I'll just quickly uh, distill my thoughts down because I was in the middle, but I thought Sandy had something relevant to Rachel, which she did. Um, uh, very very quickly, um, I, I think a lot of the angst in the community was caused by the fact that um, a lot of people feel that RMMA doesn't consult with them enough and doesn't engage with them enough. Um, uh, talking to those ratepayers, they don't feel like they're really part of the process. Central Market is a is a a similar beast in that it's an S42, but um, it's different in that you've got traders there, they're there every day, they're next door to one another, um, uh, you know, they work long hours together, they've got their own association, um, there's only, you know, 70, 70 odd to deal with, um, so it's a, a little bit more of a tight-knit um, group in that respect, um, uh, and so they're, they're a lot more representative because of that. Um, uh, as far as their board is concerned, so that's the that's the how the RMMA is viewed. Um, I also do worry about the accountability of that structure because we only see them once every twelve months, um, and I think in in the revised, uh, well, completely reimagined, is that word again? Sorry, um, uh, S forty two agency, um, uh, we need to have more regular reporting and engagement um, uh, with who, whomever their chair is and their board. Um, and on that as well, I do think we need to formalise um, uh, some sort of representation model for businesses, whether it's a, a couple of directly elected uh, board members from um, uh, something like, uh, I suppose, what is the next step from the business collective that, that any business owner in the city can, can, can join um, uh, and be a part of. I think that that representative model needs to be built into it um, uh, as well. Um, uh, and, and so I think it's really important for us to get all these things right. And that's what spooked a lot of people. They just thought, oh gosh, we're just going down this path, expanding the RMMA and, and, and it's gonna be a, a bigger RMMA when a lot of people don't already disagree with um, how it's operating. 
uh, to date. So the, that consultation, getting that feedback, answering the questions as the Lord Mayor suggested, better dissemination of information. But on the on the, the other side of that coin, more gathering of feedback because I mean, the, the, for the for our businesses, this is their livelihood. Um, they know it well. The people involved in the ABC know um, uh, what what it takes to represent the businesses around them. They've been engaging them for many years now and working on this and I commend them for it. Um, as well, I'll just touch on the precincts um, briefly with regards to structure. Um, there is absolutely room for precinct groups to be involved and formalized. Um, uh, to my thinking, um, that would be by means of uh, potentially an advisory panel whereby the chair of each precinct group is, is involved in that and they engage directly with the economic development agency um, uh, and then uh, and then by virtue of that through their members um, as well passing it down through their precinct so um, when there's a, a piece of marketing that needs to be done and comms plans that need to be drawn up say you know this is what we're doing for Christmas economic development agency engages with the precinct group um, uh, advisory sort of board and then they then go and, and speak to their precinct groups and there's that that two-way os osmosis um, uh, of, of information um, and the economic development agency um, uh, in lieu of the grant funding would actually provide significant administrative um, support to the precinct groups I think that's that's how it would um, how it would best operate because um, the precinct groups are run by volunteers um, they know their businesses like the back of their hand, but there are other skill sets that the agency will bring um, to them and to their precinct, and that's where the real um, where the real value is. Help professionalise a lot of our um, our precinct groups and um, make sure they're doing the best job they possibly can be, armed with uh, the backing of the economic development agency. So, those are my um, uh, brief thoughts. If anyone, if that prompted anything else from anyone, I will just ask again if any further comments wish to be made on the topic or Michelle if you perhaps wanted to respond to any of that if there was anything in there um, no I think it's very um, very clear from council that our uh, very next steps are to go back to our business community including our precinct groups um, and help uh, and have their input in terms of um, what that representation might be whether it's um, you know, the model that you're talking about, um, Deputy Lord Mayor, or or other models, and that, that's really a uh, a good opportunity to get down to what you know the nuts and bolts of this might look like, and bring that back to council for some discussion. Thanks, Michelle. There's a long way to go, but we're we're doing it at pace, so I um, really appreciate your work um, there. With that, we will um, move on to the next item. Oh gosh, that's only four three. Okay, um, uh, the undergrounding funding application uh, two five two South Terrace development, um, and I'm going to take this one as red and just see, uh, uh, Council Martin, you wish to speak? Please enlighten us. Um, yes, just some advice from the administration. I have uh, no familial or financial relationship with the proposer, but I know the proposer will. Um, is it such that I have a conflict? Uh, Rudy, are you able to chime in on that one? Uh, hello, members. Uh, just um, letting you know that um, no conflicts of interest exist tonight because it is not a decision-making forum tonight. It is a committee uh, which has no decision-making power. So therefore no conflicts of interest exist. Okay. I don't necessarily accept that by the way. Um, I, I think um, the authorities have a different view, but in any case, thank you. The uh, Local Government Act specifically um, talks to these in section 73 and uh, the next few sections, and um, that's specifically linked to decision-making, not to uh, a non-decision-making committee. I understand that's your view. Uh, thank you, Rudy. And of course, if anyone has questions around conflicts, um, they can always ask before the meeting. And, and if they require further materials, they're always available. Um, from our well-equipped governance team. Were there any questions on this one 
or any comments to be made? Okay, there being none, we will move on to 4.4, four, um, significant tree removal, Lefevre Park. Um, and I'm gonna take this one as red as well and see if there were any questions or comments that needed to be made. Councillor Martin. Just a very <laughs> brief question, Chair. Um, is there something that has prompted uh, this proposal? Um, I'm not aware of there being an incident and the papers suggest the tree has another five years of life. Has there been a threat to anyone as a consequence of the tree continuing to be there? Thank you, Matthew, if you can. Uh, through the chair, uh, the uh, the uh, Parkland uh, maintenance team do periodic reviews. They've undertaken a review of this tree, as they do with many. Um, they, they, whilst there is life left in the tree, uh, there is a risk factor associated with that. So the process is where the risk is identified that we uh, take action where, where we can and uh, we brought it to the next uh, meeting for approval. So it's not that a, a branch has fallen on somebody or somebody's lodged a complaint or whatever? Uh, through the chair, there's, as I said, through the maintenance uh, review, they, uh, they do check uh, with a fully qualified arborist to understand what the likelihood of failure is. Uh, obviously, strong gusts of winds uh, and other uh, impacts do exacerbate the issues. And obviously, uh, we want to get to them before it does actually cause a falling limb or potential harm to human health. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Sims. Thank you, Chair. Would it be possible to um, circulate a, a copy of the risk analysis that's been done? Um, just, I don't normally um, request that, but I am concerned when it's significant trees. I think we, we do need to assure ourselves that they're only being removed for the last resort. Through the chair, we can certainly uh, send that through to members. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Members, any further questions or comments on this matter? If not, thank you, Matthew, for joining us. And we will move on to item. We will move on to item four five: grant recommendations, recreation, and sport, arts, and cultural and community. And I'm going to take this one as red as well and just see if there are any questions or comments. Lots. All right, Councillor Kira is first. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, the Hull Street Centre looks to receive 150,000 uh, over three years. Um, given that the Hull Street Centre is, uh, from my understanding, essentially the Catholic Church, um, and uh, I believe, I'm led to believe, had a significant amount of money uh, in the bank. Um, has there been any sort of analysis, needs analysis uh, conducted with respect to this grant? Um, because uh, are we basically not giving a substantial amount of money to what is um, arguably uh, the most powerful uh, business in the street? Thank you, Councillor Kira. Um, Christy or Claire? Thank you, through the chair. As part of the process of the applications we receive, we don't ask um, that specific question. So we have um, taken this application on the on the basis of the merits and assessed it in relation to the the, um, the grant process. And we're now putting it to you for consideration. Well, well, thanks. Should there be uh, perhaps a reconsideration of our assessment criteria to actually assess needs if we're uh, granting sums of money to very substantial uh, businesses. I understand that would require a council decision to do okay. change the criteria. Okay, thanks. Well, I've got, I mean, I've got similar questions about, uh, say, the Adelaide Mosque and the uh, United Communities. Um, is there a reason the Adelaide Mosque is receiving uh, twice the figure of uh, Uniting uh, Communities, for example? It's the breadth of the program and, and what they've applied for, and we've assessed it on the merit of the application. Okay. Do we ever um, do we ever get more detail on these on these uh, 
these sums in general as council? Is there pre I'm just I'm not seeing any sort of detail on, on the basis of these decisions. I think that now more than ever before, given the COVID crisis and the budget constraints, uh, it's important that we um, we all have some information to base uh, the, the, the monies they're handed out. Um, is that something that can be forthcoming or what, what's the general procedure here? Uh, this is consistent with previous years, but yeah. uh, I can ask the um, director I'm, that I'm could... happy to add, um, Councillor Kira, that the um, opportunity for councillor to set the sort of parameters around um, grants funding is through the policy review process, so we're um, consistent with existing policy. Um, so obviously noting that um, it's probably time to review our grants um, policy, I'd encourage members to um, use that opportunity to either build in different parameters, different criteria, or if you're looking for a different approach around how we might fund um, some of our grants programs, then um, we'll, we can do that through a workshop environment uh, with council and bring through a, you know, a revised policy that way. Okay, well, can I, can I suggest that we have, that you, you actually facilitate such a workshop uh, sometime soon so that we actually uh, can go through some of the detail on these decisions and fine tune uh, these grants? Is that something you, you would can agree to undertake to provide soon, Claire? Um, the, the policies were reviewed um, fairly recently. I can't remember. I don't think this council has reviewed the policy. So if members do wish to do that, then perhaps an amendment to the recommendation um, to make it really clear that that's what you okay. wish to do would be helpful. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Gotcha. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Kira. Uh, Councillor Mackey. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. A uh, uh, question just to the administration. Um, with regard to the deliberative process that informs the recommendations, uh, could you just expand uh, in each of the three programs with regard to who uh, are around the table to form, uh, to consider uh, and assess the merits, uh, relative merits of um, uh, each of those, the applications in each of those programs? Yes, thank you, through the Chair. Uh, we assess these grants internally and there are specialists uh, in the team who bring their knowledge and many of them have been on the program for many years. Uh, and some of the programs are peer reviewed among the um, internal staff here. We don't at this point have an external process, however, as Claire mentioned, if there is a review process, that's certainly something that um, will be looked at. Thank you. Um, that, that's something, Councillor Mackey, that we have talked internally about, um, is um, following other jurisdictions of government and having external peer assessment of our um, grant program. So that's certainly an improvement to the process that you know, we'd certainly be looking to make at some point. Thank you very much. Thanks, Greg. Councillor Martin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, look, this um, is very unusual in terms of budget experience. A part of the budget is being presented to us, um, not as a workshop or part, as the part of the budget process, but for approval at Tuesday, Tuesday night's meeting of Council. Uh, I, I, I can't understand why it's separated out. I mean, we've not had a discussion we have no real idea of the context of the budget. I, I couldn't even tell you what the overall expenditure will be in each of the areas, never, ne, never mind what our total revenue is. Why have we broken ranks from all of the previous years to present this as a separate item for, for inclusion in council committee and then council before the budget comes to council? I assume it's got to do with the financial year uh, and when our budget will be timed this year due to COVID, but Claire, did you want to? Yeah, so um, we always bring through grant um, and then the years where we do three year sponsorship funding in June, um, it's always be timed that way. Um, that's because of the six month um, opening of our grant recommendations. So members would have uh, considered this last 
you um, as well. So that timing hasn't shifted or changed. Um, the fact that um, from a budgeting perspective, um, you know, we have made it very clear that um, things that are ongoing in nature, um, where there's any sort of change to those budgets, we will obviously bring those through to council members for decision and discussion uh, prior to um, entering into any sort of long-term agreements or, or arrangements. Um, you know, so for example, connect a bus, um, you'll be considering that tonight, um, you know, any sort of uh, commitment beyond um, uh, beyond the, you know, the one year is um, usually um, considered um, you know, as part of any sort of budget deliberation. Um, we haven't made any changes to the funding. Uh, that funding is still there. So unless council wishes to completely overhaul and review um, their approach to our grants, um, our recommendation is to um, continue as is for now, noting that, you know, any sort of policy changes further down the track uh, would need to flow through any sort of agreements with um, any um, recipients that receive funding beyond one year. And it's, well, always, I, it's always subject to budget, so we make that very clear. No, no, I, I hear you. It's just that we're not being asked to look at fees and charges, which also um, should be applied from the 1st of July. But anyway, all right. Um, and can I just we say... Well, we'll go to the councillor. You'll see fees and charges as part of the expenditure framework. Um, you'll be considering that on the 23rd. Of June. Is that a council meeting or a committee meeting? Uh, still deciding, but um, originally we were going to do committee followed by formal council, but um, on discussion with the team today, we'll probably do council breaking into informal to, to make it easier. So um, just still working through with governance on the best mechanism to enable that to happen. All right. Okay. Well, look, I, I hear what you're saying. Can I just also say that the level of documentation information provided on this occasion is less than previous years. We've been able to look at what was provided in the previous year with a calendar that discreetly shows you what the expenditure pattern has been here. It's a matter of chasing through it and trying to understand instead of it being set up in a very clear way. Um, and I would much prefer if we could do that in the future. Um, uh, but look, uh, separate to that, can you explain to me why, um, and I have read the documents, why councils should, for example, in uh, the community development area with the arts and culture budget, uh, where th th there's a quarter of a million dollars to be spent, just agree to hand over most of that um, to um, be distributed under delegation? I mean, is that really necessary? That sounds rhetorical. Um, did you want me to, do you want well, to change it, the limits of delegation? Is that what you're asking? Um, so you think the delegation is at the wrong level and therefore... Yeah, I do, sorry, I, do I do, I do. And look, you know, I, 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 I agree with um, uh, what's been said by previous speakers. Uh, it would be good to have a discussion about this. Um, but look, can I ask specific questions? Um, uh, there are a couple of things that um, I wondered about. Um, uh, for example, um, the Aboriginal Sobriety Group at uh, Attachment A, page 110. Um, was the previous funding $50,000 a year for each of the previous years? And this goes to the question of not being able to read it properly. Was it 50000 for each of the previous three years? And for the next three years, we're proposing 50,000 for those three years. Is that correct or have I misread that? Through the chair, the, it was 50,000 per year for previous years and it's 150,000 over three years. So it's exactly the same going forward. Okay, look, uh, it's or the way the format doesn't, uh, doesn't help. And why at page 112, attachment A, are we providing only um, one year of funding um, to the uh, Brian Burdigan Clinic, which, as everyone knows, is the uh, medical clinic that uh, looks after homeless people, people with uh, drug and alcohol addiction and the like. And in fact, at the, uh, at the height of the pandemic was one of the few places that was 
um, testing homeless people for um, um, COVID-19. Um, why are we only providing that? I don't understand what it is we, what hoop it is we expect them to jump through in order to give them more certainty and um, three years of funding as we've done previously. Thank you, through the chair. Um, we don't fund health services. So in the application we've received from the Brian Burdekin uh, uh, Clinic, we have um, assessed it based on the criteria and believe it to be actually um, reasonably low in relation to the, the assessment criteria. So we've given them a year's funding to work with them so that we can help them to um, move it into community services that we're funding through this, this fund. And then um, hopefully they will have more assurity going forward. Uh, look, I, I understand that we've had this discussion many, many years in a row. Um, they, they do the medical stuff, but they also do the community stuff. They pick up old people, they pick up people, take them to medical specialist appointments. They arrange other important services in their life. It's not just medical. Um, can we just find a criteria that uh, they can address so we don't do this every couple of years? Through the chair, I... Um... I guess perhaps they do need some additional advice about their application so that they talk to exactly that. Okay. Um, and I and just... just... I was just going to reassure you that we have um, taken on board um, previous council feedback on um, ensuring that um, the Brian Burdekin Centre, um, you know, that we can work closely with them to make sure that their application um, you know, sufficient in terms of uh, what they're trying to achieve. So we do continue to do. Okay. Well, look, I mean, uh, you know, three years w w would provide some certainty. I mean, we give that to netball groups um, for something as important as, as this. It would be good if we could find a, a strategy for dealing with it. Um, and also uniting communities and uh, at the risk of distressing Councillor Kira, who's concerned about religious groups, um, they're making a sense of sense budget support program you used to get 10,000 a year. Um, a, a, am I reading the document correctly to, 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 uh, to, to see that it's been cut back to 7,000 a year? Is that correct? Page 114. We're, we're proposing 20,000 a year for three years, and previously I, I understand they've had a one off grant each year for 10 years. Sorry, for um, four years. So, well, first of all, three years, but it has been four years accumulative. So, they have um, now received a three year grant of 60,000, 20,000 over three years. So, that's more, more certainty, more maturity going forward. Okay, but it's less money. No, it's more. It's twice as much money. It was 10000 per year, and now it's 20000 per year. Okay, I'm sorry. I was, uh, again, the formatting um, made it difficult to read. And just one final question. At page 117, it's noted uh, um, there that a lot of cities are doing a great uh, many things for their citizens. And I note that uh, administration has observed that the City of Melbourne has designed a program to assist artists and creative organisations with financial assistance during the, the pandemic. Um, could you tell me what we've done in terms of specific financial assistance to artists and uh, creative organisations? Yes, we have brought forward the grant round, or we, we held it actually during COVID to ensure that everyone had a little bit more time to apply. We have had three applications, but the intention now is to use the remaining remaining money to, um, to, to change the, the, um, the process so that, that smaller grants can be more quickly and rapidly used. We have, we're not asking for any more money. We would like to use the remaining, um, remaining money. The $50,000 will be used for categories four and six and open all year. And so um, part of that would be part of the COVID response. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair.
Thanks, Phil. Councillor Sims. Thank you, um, Deputy Lord Mayor. And look, I know we're not entering into a debate, but I did have to um, correct Councillor Kira's inaccurate comment about uh, the Hutt Street Centre and others. It is wrong to characterise that um, as a business. It is not a for-profit concern. It's an organisation that assists uh, vulnerable people in the community. Um, and uh, I also think it is wrong to characterise the mosque um, or uniting communities um, as businesses or for-profit concerns. They are not uh, for-profit concerns. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think actually the work of these organisations is very, very important um, in the context of an economic crisis. Um, and so I'd urge councillors to keep that in mind um, and not to... Um, politicise uh, the grants process by trying to uh, take money away from organisations that are providing vital support at this time. Councillor Kira. Uh, thanks. Look, um, I think uh, I'll just be very brief. Um, I think the politicisation, uh, the apex of politicising is verbaling other councillors. At no stage did I say any organisation is for profit. Uh, those are entirely the words of Councillor Sims. Uh, and I think it's pretty rich to hear that businesses can be for profit or not for profit. OK, so let's just get that very clear. I do agree with the sentiment that we should not politicise. I think councillors should look in their own backyard before they start uh, issuing that edict. All right, well, now we are skirting terribly close to the sun here. Um, no one wants to stand up like Icarus, so we'll, we'll say that's a little bit too close to debate. Um, did see, Lord Mayor, was your hand up? Uh, it was, metaphorically and... Yes, uh, and please. Electronically. Uh, look, I, I was actually just going to make a comment that I'm a little bit con um, confused, actually, because as having seen uh, these grants uh, recommendations come through to Council for many, many years, I think it's exactly the same process and exactly the same timing. So... Um, I think the information that they've given us is good. It gives us the recommendation. It gives us how much they are recommending. It gives us the previous year's funding, how much the total project costs and what the request is and their criteria rating, so, which is against our policy. Um, I do actually think uh, it would be great for us to actually sit down, particularly in a post-COVID environment and relook at the policy, even if it's a sort of a bridged version to get us through the next next couple of years. Uh, we all know the next couple of years are going to be really difficult and it is a period of time where all of us as councillors need to be really focused on bringing our city back to life and supporting those community organisations who are delivering services across our city for those most vulnerable, as well as our artists and our creatives who have, as we know, missed out on any support thus far. Uh, from um, the federal government. Um, I say federal because the state government has really upped their grants processes as well. Um, good to hear that we're going to have a rapid response program with the $50,000 um, using that remaining. I think that would be a really great initiative and really welcomed by the arts and cultural sector. Um, and uh, hopefully we can actually uh, put this to bed very soon when we go to budget. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, any other speakers on this topic? If not, I might just ask a couple of questions of um, Christy or Claire. So per, per what Councillor Kira said, there's no um, sort of means testing or financial assessments or any other sort of due diligence that's done on, on organisations that apply, any organisations that apply. the chair um, at acquittal stage, which they do have to apply to have to provide a financial audit in a statement, but not at application. Sorry, what is the acquittal? That's that's about where that's when you're going to hand over the money, correct? Is that? No, no that's at the end of the grant spot. Oh, the, oh sorry, acquit. Yes. No. Yeah, right. Okay. No, that's and that's just to show that they've spent it on what they said they were going to spend it on. And that's right, and that uh, yeah. we're happy that their finances are in order and that their public money has been spent properly. Yeah, and so you do look at their whole the whole organisation's finances, or broadly speaking, or to what degree? 
We can request an audit report, but broadly we ask for um, the financial statements that are a part of the acquittal process and most organisations that we're dealing with are auditors. Yeah, but so what, what I'm saying is that you're only asking for the financial uh, particulars relevant to the execution of the funding deed or the grant or what have you? Uh, yes, correct. Yes, okay, all right. So for example, you wouldn't have on file um, uh, from 2018 or 2019 financial year that um, uh, one of our recipients, um, or proposed recipients this year, uh, being the Hutt Street Centre had liquid assets of over 900,000 for 2018 and over 10 million for 2019. I'll have to take that on notice. It may be something that they've provided in their acquittal, but it's not part of the application process. Yeah. It just it just concerns me um, that that there's no sort of checks and balances based on on need, and I think need now more than ever is very important. I mean, if an organisation's liquid assets can go up for acknowledging that they are a not for profit, but they are still making uh, an operational surplus or profit in some reads of it um, of almost a million dollars over a twelve month period. Um, and we, the council, are going into millions and millions or tens of millions of dollars worth of debt in order to fund such programs, um, uh, it doesn't really seem equitable. Having said that, it may all be well and good to fund such programs, but um, perhaps there is an organisation um, that is more in need um, of, of that funding. That's my, um, that's my, that's my concern, and, and it is of great concern to me that we don't do any sort of means testing or financial checks beforehand. We only do it after the fact. Um, I just worry I just worry that there are other organisations that need funding more that also do good work who are perhaps missing out um, because we ourselves are severely financially constrained. Um, uh, the, the other thing that concerns me as well is um, locking us in for three year funding uh, deals now um, before we've seen the effects of COVID really play out um, and before we've seen the work that the council requested around uh, finding uh, I think it was 20 million dollars in operational savings and what have you before we've seen that work come through um, uh, it, it before we, before we have any sort of visibility on what's happening with all of our festivals and such um, going into the future I, I, I'm really loath to, 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 to consider a three-year three-year deal now um, uh, before any of that sort of comes to the forefront. I mean, I, I do understand the, the desire to give organisations that we work with to give them certainty, um, but we ourselves don't have certainty. Um, uh, Joe Blow running a coffee shop down the street doesn't have certainty. Um, and so I don't think that's a luxury that's actually ours to give because that money may not exist come next financial year and the year after that, and the year after that, which is precisely what we're locking ourselves into. Um, uh, so those, those, are, those are some of my concerns, Christy, probably uh, to quote Claire, a little bit rhetorical, um, uh, but I just thought I'd share those with you. Um, Councillor Martin, you requested a toilet break. Is that what your hand was up for? Absolutely. All right. Um, uh, I do know other councillors have raised the prospect with me, so I'll just check. Was there anyone else who wished to discuss this matter? Is that is, is that your hand up, Phil? Or well, that's are, are that's you my hand that up to go to the loo. But I might also say, uh, look, you know, can we just have, you know, a truce on the Hutt Street Centre? It really is starting to look like a vendetta. There's no vendetta here, Councillor. It's Martin. looking, it's looking like it. It's looking like it. I'm going to ask that we, uh, at Phil's suggestion, adjourn for a quick toilet break. I think five minutes is um, is appropriate. Do we? Sorry, let me just scroll through all of your not so talking heads. All right, I don't see any disagreements, and I see some thumbs up. All right, we will uh, adjourn with a show of hands for a few moments five minutes and we'll return at, uh, well, let's say 20 past seven.
Members, I'm advised that we uh, now have a quorum again, so we will resume the meeting. Um, and given we concluded the last uh, item of business, uh, we will come to 4.6, which is the City Connector um, Review. And uh, I believe um, Clinton was just going to remind us of where we're at in the process regarding this. Thank you, Clinton. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Thanks, elected members. Um, through you, Chair, just quickly, uh, presentation uh, was given to Council just last week on this uh, free City Connector bus service. Um, what we're seeking through this report to Council is um, just noting that we do have a deed um, to resolve on the bus with DIPTI um, that does have some, some time constraints around it. And we also just need to um, get endorsement from council if possible, just to continue working with Dipti on the options that were presented um, last week and are contained within this report, um, just to enable us to bring back um, those options uh, fully developed for council consideration and approval to enter into a new deed with Dipti. Uh, I've got um, Shanti available uh, on the line here on the call as well to answer any detailed questions, should you have any. So, over to you. Thank you, Clinton. Uh, members, any questions on this report? Councillor Noel. Yeah, thank you, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, just as a, as a further uh, conversation in regards to the actual route, and I, I note that uh, the Lord Mayor put uh, an idea forward as well. And I was looking at it uh, and I had uh, also uh, asked the question around whether we were able to uh, uh, reroute it slightly so that it would have an opportunity to go past uh, Pulteney Street and also be close to Rundle Mall um, as, as one of those sort of points. Uh, then go back to the, to the route further down, possibly Flinders Street or so. It's just that that way this actually, uh, the, uh, the, the connector bus actually connects it to the, the major uh, uh, components of the city and, and at least uh, uh, other uh, sort of the, the three other main streets that, that uh, people associate with, which is Melbourne Street and uh, O'Connell and Hutt. But if we're able to do that, that means that we're able to bring people to Rundle Mall, to the East End, um, and it's, it will be convenient. And it is only just, a, a, in a sense, a dog leg um, uh, to achieve that. And we can you can still sort of uh, com comply reasonably well with the requirement of not duplicating uh, the, the transport uh, with uh, the tram, et cetera. But it, it is critical, it does take people to the main areas. And I just think we, we need to be concerned that, uh, uh, that, that it does that. And it's, it's more about taking you there. And if it's a minute or two longer, that, that's less important than, uh, uh, than uh, skirting around the outside of the city, uh, just giving you a, a scenic view of the parklands as you're going around. So that, that was my main concern with that. And, and then and still talking further about trials and things like that of, of other opportunities that uh, we have talked about in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Councillor Martin. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, could the administration tell me why it is that we simply accept that the state government can say, we don't want to do this anymore when there's an agreement in place to continue for the next three years? and why we wouldn't just say, abide by the contract? Clinton, Chair, could you enlighten us? Or, or Claire, what, what the agreement is? Because it, I mean, it sounds like the agreement is expiring as at the end of this financial year, but we've got information otherwise. Um, through, through the chair, um, uh, like any um, contractual arrangement, um, the parties can uh, enter into a conversation to test whether those contractual arrangements can be varied or changed. Um, essentially, uh, DIPTI through the uh, Public Transport Authority run the bus service um, through its contractual arrangements with operators that run um, the service. And this forms part of one of those services that uh, the state government run um, 
the state government uh, is essentially reviewing all of the metropolitan bus services. And because um, this service is provided as part of a service that runs through the metro area, um, there is a need to revisit um, the operations um, of this service as it impacts on that service. Um, clearly, if council do not wish to uh, be involved in um, the conversation, council can have a different conversation with the minister. Um, what we have presented in uh, both the workshop uh, last week, as well as the material that you have uh, tonight, um, are some of the options for consideration. It is council's prerogative to take an alternate view if council believes that that is uh, a more appropriate course of action. And how long does the contract run? Um, through the chair, um, the, um, the details of um, the contract are included in the appendices, uh, the attachments that we've given you. So um, essentially, um, DIPTI is looking at implementing uh, a new contract as of the 1st of, um, 1st of July 2020. Uh, the contract does have, the deed I should say, um, does have um, additional time to run. Uh, that is detailed in your report. Um, I'm just getting the dates for you and I'm going through to the report, if you can just let me do that. Well, uh, uh, my recollection is it still has two years to run, is that correct? Uh, that, is, uh, that is correct. I'm just checking what the actual date is um, through the chair. Um, uh, 2023 is the date when it is due to expire. I refer you to paragraph seven of our report. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, if I might just make a couple of comments, Chair. Um, uh, we should be saying um, to the Minister for Transport, um, um, go away, and in fact I'd probably use a stronger word than that, instead of saying, um, yes, Minister, we should be saying, no, Minister, this deed has two years to run, and as we abide by the contracts we enter into, we expect you to honour this. Um, taking the course that we are is a bit like a blue healer calling out heal and it sits and does what it's told. We, we, we are not uh, the dogs of anybody. We should assert our moral and legal rights for this agreement to be honored. Now, um, there is, in my view, uh, no point in uh, stuff considering problems when the first question is, Minister, why don't you do the right thing? Secondly, if there is to be any revision of the service, then it should come from the City of Adelaide. This is the City of Adelaide service. The City of Adelaide founded it and it developed it. And it developed it as a means of connecting the city and connecting people. This, this is not about money. And, and let me tell you, uh, this council is always talking about money, never talking about people. We just heard it a moment ago. Can we make sure it runs past Rundle Mall or you know this street or that street where there's a business? This is actually about connecting people together. People who live in the city south, the west, the east, connecting them with people living in the north. It's connecting people who live in aged care facilities, people who visit hospitals in uh, the city and in the north. It is about connecting communities. I remind members that this council has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars developing the service. We have established disability uh, approved access points for the bus, many of them at the cost, individual cost of fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. And it's proposed under the, the information that's presented to you here that half of those stops, half, 50%, will cease to operate. I have people who live in the aged care facility, helping hand, who are ringing me and saying, what the hell are you doing? 
And the answer is, I don't think we know what we're doing. If we knew what we were doing, we would be standing up to the government and saying, we want this service to continue. And only then, and only then, would we consider some alternatives with a consultation process that we conducted, not one that we rely on government feedback, not, not just a government funded consultation. This is our service. We need to retain it. We need to make sure it is there for our ratepayers. And, and let me tell you, if we don't, then people are going to say again, what a dysfunctional, unrepresentative council. Thank you, Councillor Martin. And I just remind you about the rules um, that uh, we are not in here to enter into debate, just to um, make quick uh, comments. Um, uh, but of course, I'm very pleased to hear that you are one for holding up contracts that you've signed. Um, uh, no doubt that extends to the central market arcade redevelopment that you have been a vehement champion of. Um, uh, and I'm sure you'll be there when the ribbon gets cut. All right, Councillor Kira. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, administration, uh, look, um, $7 per person per trip, is that correct? Is that the average figure? I'll unmute myself. Uh, to the chair, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. $7 per person per trip. Okay. Th th that is pretty eye-openingly uh, expensive. And in fact, that is, um, that is pretty close uh, to uh, an Uber trip uh, for each of the, uh, close to the cost of an Uber trip for each person who uses the bus service. Um, should ratepayers uh, be providing the cost equivalent of a free Uber travel, uh, a free Uber travel to everyone in the city? Uh, through the chair, is that a question? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. It's a bit question. Perhaps, perhaps it's a uh, perhaps it's a reflective question. Um, okay, the options that we've been given um, in the uh, agenda papers. Why isn't there an option for um, adopting the DIPTI route changes, uh, but basically removing uh, those other routes that are basically not worth it? Uh, through the chair, could you repeat that question? Okay, so we've got a series of options in the agenda paper. Um, what seems to be missing is an option for adopting the DIPTI recommended changes, uh, which sees some reduction in spend, uh, but alongside there, there is no scope or no option to rationalise the existing routes, basically pair away those routes that are not worth it, that contribute uh, the most uh, to that $7 per person cost. Well, how come, I'm just wondering why that option is not presented. Um, through the chair, if uh, I can refer you to um, the table on page seven of our report, um, which contains the option options. Option two is the uh, the DIPTI um, the DIPTI proposed connector route co-funded with with DIPTI that is uh, listed there. Yes, but but what I'm saying is you haven't included an option uh, an extra option which includes a deputy proposal for the, the route changes, but also, uh, I mean, let me put it this way, Shanti, where is the option for removing the excess route, uh, routes, removing the parts of the service that are basically not worth it? Where, where is that option to, to, to properly, uh, well, rationalize this, this service? Um, through the chair, um, the work, um, with, um, administrations of the opinion that the work that DIPTI um, has undertaken essentially removes the duplication um, with the existing free tram service um, that operates in the city uh, and it removes any other duplication that DIPTI sees um, that, that is already being serviced by other bus routes within the city, um, within the uh, city in North Adelaide. Okay. So we've I'm not, ready. we've, so to, to, to put it simply, we've uh, we have um, not um, we have not uh, taken any other routes out uh, based on um, the feedback we received from um, council last week. Okay, um, so it, it, is it because of a council directive that we are not considering removing uh, those aspects of the routes that are that are contributing most to the cost or that, that are most inefficient? 
um, through the chair, um, DIPTI have undertaken that work based on both their data of patronage as well as uh, uptake of the service. And so they have essentially paired back the service based on the data that they have collected. Uh, but, and so- But we haven't done any of our own assessment. Uh, we have essentially taken the advice from DIPTI because DIPTI hold that data. Okay, all right, thanks. Finally, why is there not an option for a part paid service? Uh, through the chair, um, that has never been part of the conversation, so that has not been part of the exploration. Um, the items that we have gone back to sort of understand is uh, the, the options that are listed in the report, uh, but not uh, uh, that the idea of a part paid service was not, um, not flagged for further, further consideration when we met last week. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Jesse. <clears throat> Councillor Sims. Thanks, uh, Chair. And further to <clears throat> Councillor Kira's question, um, through you, Chair, I would highlight the workshop we had uh, last year when there was a discussion about the potential to introduce a user pay model. And uh, I moved an amendment um, which ensured that the service would remain free and that that was going to be the focus of uh, Council's advocacy um, with the Minister. And indeed, as a result of that resolution, there was an agreement that um, council administration would continue to engage with the state government with a view to retaining um, the service. Um, so I'm still a little bit confused about why we're at the position that we're in at the moment, because I thought we had agreed 12 months ago that this was a service that we would retain and prioritise. We had significant discussion um, about it at an elected member level at that time. I understand that DIPTI have now come out and said, well, they don't wish to uh, honour their side of the bargain. But I agree with um, Councillor Martin um, in that I think we should be urging the state government to actually satisfy their requirements under the uh, contract. They've entered into a contract with council. We have entered into an agreement with them in good faith why on earth would we simply allow the state government to tear up that agreement um, and uh, not um, provide um, this uh, vital service? Um, and Councillor Kira has talked about um, areas that are not uh, financially um, viable or um, he wants to rationalise them or they're not being properly operated or whatever the term it was that he um, used. The reality is, is that this service is used by some very vulnerable members of our community, people who um, are on uh, low incomes, uh, some members of the community that are relying on support services, and uh, the bus is used to um, transport them around the city and ensure that they can be connected to the services that they need. And I don't think um, expecting people to install an Uber app or uh, anything of the like is going to cut it. Um, people have relied on this service, um, and I think it is part of our responsibility as a uh, city council to provide it to the community free of charge. However, it doesn't mean we have to shoulder the, the full responsibility alone, and I think we have an obligation to assert our rights um, as a, a party to a contract and to engage strongly with Minister Canole on this and urge him to actually meet um, his side of the bargain. I don't know why on earth we would let the state government off the, the hook with this. I mean, what sort of precedent does that set when we enter into partnerships with government? Um, and uh, I'd be interested to know from administration what other um, agreements, if any, we have with um, the state government uh, that could then be called into question should we allow the state government to get off the hook when it comes to meeting their obligations in this instance. Um, through the chair, I'm, I'm not aware of any other contracts um, that may fall into this category. Um, I might need to defer um, onto uh, Pinton or Mark. No, through the chair, no, I'm not aware of any others either. Um, um, yeah, at this stage. 
And look, to be fair, we're the ones that have entered into contracts with the state government and, uh, you know, we've been dragging our heels with the, uh, the bikeway. But at the end of the day, I think this is a really um, vital project and we shouldn't be um, letting the state government off the hook. Thank you, Robert. Councillor Kuros. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have some questions just um, to understand this contract. So um, is there an exit clause that they're using to not continue to honour this contract? Uh, um, through the chair, um, any any deed would have an exit clause. I would have to take that on notice to just to, um, to uh, review the deed itself to find what that exit clause actually says. So I'd take that on notice. Yes, I really would like to know that because I we have a contract arrangement. Um, we've we've entered in this contract with the state government. I don't understand on what basis uh, that they're withdrawing this contract. From is it, if it's if they're exercising an exit clause, I really would like to know that. Um, I am an advocate for this bus uh, service to continue. Um, it services um, most of North Adelaide, and I know that the Lord Mayor circled um, a revised uh, route in, in regards to it, and I, I would would like to explore that if that's what we're in a position to do, and we have to do contract actually because they're exercising their right to not continue with the contract but if we have a contract I would like this service to continue um, and if anything I probably would say I would like to extend it to go to be able to go to the aquatic centre um, but you know I, I would take it for what it is right now because it is a much used um, a bus service it is um, used heavily in the North Adelaide area um, it does service them well um, and it serves the lower part and the uh, western side of uh, the um, of the area and uh, it is also to make note we do not have a tram service that goes down that way um, and it uh, supports the community but it also um, supports tourism as well um, so and it also supports our businesses and we need that to continue especially during this time and we cannot make this difficult for for movement around our city to be compromised um, if we take this service away. But in order to continue to have this conversation, I need to know what the contractual arrangement is in regards to them exercising this notion of um, revisiting the route. Thank you. Um, through the chair, um, as explained in the report, um, DIPD um, are intending uh, on taking um, all of their public transport service changes uh, to public uh, and a public engagement piece. Um, we're still awaiting advice from DIPD as to when that's likely to occur. Um, my understanding from a conversation this afternoon with DIPD staff is uh, that it will be towards the end of June. However, that's not confirmed. Um, so any changes um, to any of the routes will be subject to a consultation process which DIPTI will, um, will undertake. Um, that's the first thing. The question of um, where the route uh, eventually ends up being located um, uh, will be determined obviously by consultation with both the public and consultation with council. So any feedback that council has with regard to where its preferred route will need to be taken into consideration. And I guess the third part um, to that is um, any changes to um, the route, the city connector route, um, whether it's um, a, a, a larger catchment uh, or a more frequent service or less frequent service or has cost implications. So um, if you refer to the report that we have prepared, um, there are some figures in there around what the different costs are. Um, we've sort of tried to apply some ballpark figures. We haven't had those figures confirmed um, through DIPTI because they are commercial, DIPTI's figures are commercial in confidence. So uh, we've, we've tried to make some, I guess, um, uh, uh, some considered and educated judgments with coming up with the numbers that are there. So. Um, the service that DIPD have proposed, which they have now shared with us, um, which is the subject of this report, um, is for a, a 20 minute service for both North Adelaide and, and the city, the city, um, the CBD. Um, 
any changes to any of the routes may uh, change both the frequency of the service, it may change the need for additional buses to service the route. And so all of those things will most likely have cost implications on uh, what it would cost to deliver the service. Thank you, Shanti. Uh, members, very conscious of time and um, we've spoken about this at length and we're not actually making a decision here. Uh, Councillor Martin, if it is a quick question, yes. Otherwise, um, we can take it offline. Oh, look, I was just going to ask the administration, can we put the position to Dipti that if there is to be any review of the service, we will, if not conduct the review ourselves, um, we will at least be involved in the planning of that and uh, be an honest broker. Um, through the chair, um, um, council isn't um, um, the expert in the provision of bus services. So we may need to, if we were uh, required to undertake that work, we may require to get uh, assistance um, with that work. I'm not sure if um, Clinton, if you uh, wanted to add to that. Yeah, thanks, Shanti. Through the chair, I think um, the key issue here, Councillor Martin, is that this free city connector bus service can't be dealt with or reviewed in isolation to the remainder of the metropolitan bus and tram network. So it has to be done in collaboration with Dipti. As Shanti alluded to earlier um, tonight, they have all of the data. Um, the Free City Bus Connector service is not a ticketed service, therefore there isn't a lot of trip data. A lot of the data we have is from field surveys and, and monitoring of bus stops. So um, we are heavily reliant on Dipti to undertake any sort of review, review in that space. All right. Uh, thank you, Clinton and Shanti. We will now move on. Let me just bring up my run sheet. What do we have it there? Yes, Federal Parliamentary Inquiry into Homelessness. I'm going to take this one as read. Ask if there are any questions here. Councillor Sims. Thank you. Um, look, firstly, I just wanted to thank administration for um, the work on this. I, I thought it was a good um, report. The only thing that I thought was um, missing from uh, my perspective is kind of a, a general principle statement about the fact that we regard housing as being a, a fundamental human right. And I wondered whether something along those lines could be included if administration would consider including that in the report. Well, we can't consider anything. The report as it stands is what's going to go to council. Um, you can always... Well, I'm asking the question because if the question is answered in the affirmative, then I won't need to worry about trying to uh, amend it on the floor of council. Yes, what I'm saying is they are unable to answer that in the affirmative. The answer is in the negative. They're not allowed to change it. But I'm asking if that could be considered or is this, we're not allowed to give that... We're not allowed to no, the, the report as it is in the papers is what is going to council. No questions asked. So, oh, what have we been doing here for the last three hours? You've been interrogating the matters at hand. I mean, no, nothing, nothing that we say here. I mean, this, this is why I wonder why everyone drones on. The recommendations in front of you of what's is what's going into council. Um, so why the and nothing we done? nothing we say here has any consequence? Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying it has any consequence. The aim is to inform you so that you can make better decisions and ideally the best decisions possible when it comes to council. That is the aim. But if there are things in this that you wish to have included or not included, you will need to move it as an amendment. Um, okay. In the All right. I will, I will follow it up um, as a, uh, an amendment. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, councillors and Lord Mayor? Nope, there being none. Um, thank you for that. The report was very good, and I'm glad to see the inclusion of the what we've learned during COVID has um, uh, has aided in the in the production of an even better 
um, submission than what we had before. Um, we now come to 4.8, the North Street Traffic Investigations. Um, uh, Shanti is with us, but I'm going to take this as read. Any, any questions or commentary on this one? No, a fairly uncontroversial um, report. Thank you, Shanti. Uh, that brings us to the end of the recommendations held in public. Uh, we now move to 5.1, which is exclusion of the public to consider 6.1 and 6.2 um, in confidence. And just to confirm, Jenny, uh, do I need to move these together or I move these at the same time? Move them separately. Thank you, Deputy Law Mayor. Okay, all right, I'll seek a mover for 6-1, Strategic Property Matter. Uh, Councillor Martin, is that you moving? No, uh, all right. I'm uh, wishing to indicate that I wish to oppose that. Okay, once we move into debate, you can. Uh, Councillor Kira, moving, seconded Councillor Abrahimzadeh. Uh, Councillor Kira, did you wish to speak? Councillor Abraham today. No uh, members. Are there any other? Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Councillor Martin, your hand is still up. Is that a? Can you nod if that's a yes? Or noting we've we've already taken notice of your opposition. But okay, you wish to speak. I, look, I just again wish to draw to the attention of elected members that uh, this is a matter related to. Um, uh, strategic property um, involving council and such matters, particularly this circumstance, um, um, that it should be heard in public. There is absolutely no reason why um, this should not be heard in public. It is not damaging to council in any way. Um, it, in fact, it could be argued that um, it is a good thing for council, but uh, it should not be heard in confidence. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Uh, as I'm seeing no other hands up, I'll go to Councillor Kira to sum up. I'm gonna take that as a summed up. We put that to the vote, those in favor, those against, that is carried. And uh, we will go to the exclusion motion for 6-2. I will seek a mover and a seconder. Moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by, sorry, I think I would all too quick. Who was seconding that one? Councillor Abrahimzadeh. Uh, Lord Mayor, do you wish to speak? Councillor Abrahimzadeh. Members, any other, any other speakers on this? Lord Mayor to sum up, summed up. Those in favour? Those against? Sorry, Rob, I didn't, I didn't, I missed your hand there. Sorry. Those in favour again? Those against? Thank you, that is carried. All right, um, uh, with that, I'll ask Jenny if you can please eject anyone who is not